Hello and welcome to the Irish Hospice Foundation webinar on grief at work during COVID-19, how we can support colleagues and employees. My name is Brefney McGuinness and I work in the bereavement department in the Irish Hospice Foundation. For over 15 years, uh, the Irish Hospice Foundation has taken a lead in providing support, training and research to employers and to employees on coping with grief. In a recent survey, uh, which we carried out in 2018, we looked at what are the most important things that bereaved employees want from their employer. And interestingly, the most important thing that employees want is to be treated with compassion by their employer. 75% of respondents said that they wanted to be treated with compassion when they experience a bereavement um, uh, uh, from their employer. This has become even more important uh, in the recent uh, events that have taken place across the world and here in Ireland. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed our workplaces and changed our lives, but compassion is even more important now particularly for those who have experienced deaths related to COVID-19. We have produced a fact sheet for employers on how to support uh, employees and staff and colleagues who are bereaved. The main takeaway from this uh, fact sheet, which you can download, and I'll give you the link for that in a moment. Uh, the main takeaway from this is that um, what it really helps at the moment is what we would call bereavement first aid. And bereavement first aid is three simple steps. To acknowledge the loss of the employee, um, and that means simply saying, I am really sorry to hear about your dad or your mom, whatever it is, and if you know the person's name, good to use that name. Secondly, to validate the feelings and the experiences of the employee who is bereaved. Um, and there can be a range of feelings. And the really important thing here from your point of view is just to acknowledge that these are normal given the circumstances that we are in and what the person has experienced. And the third point is to support in whatever way your organization uh, supports its bereaved employees. Perhaps you have a bereavement policy. Uh, you may have flexible policies on working. And the really important thing here is to talk to the bereaved employee about what would be helpful for them. Um, and signpost. If you're concerned, if the uh, employee who is bereaved needs more, uh, to point them towards resources that are available. These can be available in the community. And as you can see here, we have the Irish Hospice Foundation Bereavement Support Line. This is a new initiative which we've begun. Uh, and this can be a good resource for you in your workplace. And we would recommend this as a support for employees who are bereaved. Uh, it's a phone line. It's open Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And the phone number is 1800 80 70 77. And this is a free service. So key message, bereavement first aid, acknowledge the loss, validate the employee's feelings and experiences, signpost and support. Um, support in your own way and whatever you provide in your organisation and signpost to other supports such as the Irish Hospice Foundation Bereavement Support Line. I'm now going to hand you over to my colleague Orla Keegan who is Head of Research and Education in the Irish Hospice Foundation and Orla is going to coordinate this webinar. The Irish Hospice Foundation, as I said, is hosting this webinar and we're a voluntary organisation and our vision is that no one should face death or bereavement without the care and the support that they require. Um, so bereavement support is, is a large part of our vision here at the Irish Hospice Foundation. Um, we're on the eve of July um, and really the past three and a half months and our shared COVID experience has really brought grief and loss into a very sharp focus for everyone. Um, and I think that we have found it, many of us have found it very difficult to watch uh, suffering um, and loneliness um, and isolation 
um, that has uh, that has occurred through this period. Most of what we expect around funeral rituals and social support has been turned on its head, and it's been a difficult time um, and a difficult challenge to make sense of of the impact of this. Um, on the other side, uh, I think we really believe that our hearts as, as a society have been opened um, and that we are looking at new and more energetic ways of reaching out and supporting people who, who've been bereaved. In the usual world, um, we would always say in Ireland that 80 people die every single day. Um, and not one of those people is a statistic. Um, there'll be somebody's grandparent or parent or wife or brother or sister or good friend. Um, so grief is is always with us. Um, and it's something that we've we've been very conscious of for a long time. Um, and our grief at work program in particular has focused on the fact that the majority of us spend the majority of our day in work. Um, and grief is always with us. So the webinar today is trying to look at some of the ways that we might begin to understand the impact of COVID, try to understand, well, what do we know about grief and the ways of grieving and the variety of ways of grieving? Um, and what can we do to, to support each other? I'm very conscious that some of the people who are logged in here today, and, and there are many of you, there's over 200, um, some of you will have been recently bereaved. And, you know, you may be feeling raw. Um, look after yourself. Uh, through the webinar, we certainly will point you uh, towards the direction of different resources that, that may help you. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how we're organising this, this webinar over the next hour or so, um, so that you know what to expect. We're going to have two speakers, um, Breffney McGuinness from the Irish Hospice Foundation and Linda Murray from the Technological University, Dublin. So through their talks, you'll be thinking things and observing things. And what we'd ask you to do is to um, put your questions into the question and answer function on the bottom of your screen. So there should be a menu on the bottom of your screen and towards the right, there will be a Q&A function. Um, we'll be monitoring the questions and we will try and feed them back to Breffney and Linda at the end of the session um, and to answer as many of them as we possibly can. Those we can't answer, we'll be following up with a resource pack from the webinar and we'll put some extra information in there. Um, in terms of those questions, anything you ask us, it will be invisible on the screen. And um, so any of the other participants won't be able to see that. Um, you have total privacy in this webinar. You can neither see nor interact with the other participants. We're going to record the webinar and our reasons for doing that um, are so that we have a resource that we can put up on our website that other people can, can learn from. And again, I reassure you that neither um, your writing or your presence here at the webinar today um, will be visible to anybody. Um, so I'm going to start, we're, we're going to be try, trying to be quite strict on time. Um, so I'm going to pass you over to our first speaker, uh, Breffney McGuinness. And Breffney's our training manager here at the Irish Hospice Foundation. And as a, as a part of his work, um, he instigated a number of years ago the Grief at Work programme. And he works with organisations from a variety of sectors, um, from the voluntary public service and the commercial sector, um, advising and working with organisations to help them support uh, colleagues and management and staff who have been bereaved. Um, so thank you, Breffney. Thanks very much, Orla. And again, uh, a very warm welcome to everyone uh, who has joined this webinar. And I know we've, we've people from many different sectors and even different countries. So again, just on behalf of the Irish Hospice Foundation, a very warm welcome to you. Um, uh, I'm going to run through a number of slides. Um, 
when I can get uh, my screen to behave itself. So if you could just bear with me and we can get going then. And as Orla said, we are um, encouraging you to um, think of your questions uh, and to put them in using the question and answer function that Orla has mentioned at the bottom of your screen. So to help you with that, um, could I ask maybe just to take a moment before we dive into um, the content of this webinar and just think, is there one thing that you would like to get out of today's webinar? Is there one particular thing you'd like to leave with? And could I ask you, please, uh, just take a moment about that. What is one thing you'd like to leave with? And if you can use the question and answer function on the bottom of your screen, and to input your question there. And as Orla said, these are confidential. Uh, they are being monitored and we'll gather them together uh, and do our best to answer as many of them as we can in the question and answer section, which we will have at uh, a quarter to two for about 10 minutes at the end of the webinar. So just gonna give you a moment to do that. Just think, what is one thing you'd like to get out of this webinar today? As Orla mentioned, uh, the Grief at Work programme is part of the Irish Hospice Foundation's um, mission, if you like, to strive for the best care at end of life and in bereavement for all people. And that's our mission. That's what we're about. What we're going to look at today are three areas. Firstly, the impact of COVID-19 on grieving in the workplace. Um, secondly, what are some tips for supporting colleagues and staff who are grieving? some of the things that might help and some of the things that we might uh, not do uh, are the things that don't help. And then we're going to look at a case study and this is the experience of Technology University Dublin uh, and Linda Murray will be giving an input on that. And that's really where they have integrated um, grief support as part of their staff wellbeing program. Um, and Linda's going to tell us a little bit about her experience in doing that. But I suppose as Orla mentioned at the start, uh, we're living in very strange times. Um, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed our lives, uh, it measured everybody's lives. Um, and as of the 29th of June, um, there were 1,736 deaths in Ireland, that's in the Republic of Ireland. Um, and as Orla, Orla also said, that's a number, but each death is a family is a brother, a sister, a granddad, a grandmom. Um, and for those families, their world has stopped. And this picture that you see here is of Balali Church in Dublin. And um, part of their response during the COVID-19 pandemic was to place a white cross on the wall of the church for each person who died. Um, and as you can see, um, the crosses have taken over the whole outside of the church. It gives us maybe a bit of a snapshot of just the extent of how COVID has impacted on people. And this is above what is normal in Ireland. And it gives us a bit of a sense of the magnitude of what Orla also mentioned, the pain and the suffering that there is for families. And this is the reality for you in your workplaces, with your staff, with your colleagues, with your employees. This is the reality that people are living through at the moment. How can we support people uh, around that? So, um, oops, I've jumped ahead, excuse me. Uh, I'm going to show a short video now. Some of you may have seen last night um, the uh, RTE Investigates program, which was looking at the COVID-19 uh, situation. Um, we've got a short clip, three minutes uh, from that program. Uh, just to give you a heads up, it, it might be a bit tough viewing for some people, um, but I think it's important that we get a sense of what the reality of COVID is for people, for what your employees, your colleagues, um, as relatives, as friends, uh, or indeed as colleagues may have experienced. So Amanda, if you wouldn't mind, I'll stop there. And Amanda's going to set up the video now. Very sad day today. That's the reality of COVID. People don't know this. Rapidly deteriorating. All three patients are fading. 
the only thing staff can do now is make sure they are comfortable and not in pain. Their lungs are actually just filling up with water and essentially fluid and they can't clear it, they can't cough it out, we can't treat it with any medications and they've just reached the point, the tipping points um, where their lungs aren't strong enough to fight it off. Next door to Sylvester is mother of three, Anne Williams. She's been fighting COVID-19 for 10 days. Her daughter has been coming in to spend time with her. Two doors further down is Alan, which is a pseudonym. Nurse Gavin Connors has managed to persuade Alan's husband to take a break, reassuring him he will stay with his wife. The husband is elderly. He has some underlying health conditions as well. And we need to make sure that he's strong. Ellen's husband must wear full personal protective equipment, including gloves, mask and visor, making it really difficult for him to get close to Ellen. Her husband wants to take off his mask, take off the face shield, he wants to lie in the bed beside her and he wants to give her a kiss and hold her hand, which they've been doing for the entire... There's no roadmap for these decisions. There's no, um, there's no plan. It's like absolutely no kissing, no touching. But when you bring the human side of it, and they're married for like, you know, change, it's very difficult, you know, to be the person saying no. Ellen's husband is returning from a break and Nurse Gavin takes him back into his wife. If this is your time, say goodbye. I'm sorry, they're speaking uncomfortable. I suppose today's probably been one of the tougher days. We read about numbers, we hear about numbers constantly. But they aren't numbers, these are people. These are people who have loved ones. They're not numbers. The fact that staff couldn't allow Ellen's husband to lie with his wife is taking its toll on those caring for her. It's heartbreaking. Even during normal times, it gets to you, but these are very abnormal times. I could hear what maybe his last words to his wife and what I heard that man saying, I'm, I'm not going to repeat, but by God, it's powerful. The love that was in that room even behind all oh, the PPE, the face masks. You could see the love there. It can be draining up here. It's, there's days where you go home and sometimes it's just, it's very hard to actually just shut down and try and put this place behind you. Thanks very much, Amanda. And I know that's that's uh, not easy viewing, but I suppose what it does give us is an insight into uh, just what COVID is like. And uh, I'm aware that we've uh, a number of people from um, the healthcare professions are here with us on this webinar today. And I suppose just to recognise the impact on staff of the current COVID crisis and the dilemmas sometimes that they find themselves in. Um, and the grief can come not just from uh, a death, but also maybe from not being able to care for um, those people in your care in the way that you would want to. Uh, and as that nurse was saying, having to make those decisions, um, there's no roadmap for that. that that's a really heavy uh, and difficult place for, for those staff. Um, so what are some of the um, I suppose the realities around COVID. Um, for all of us, whether you're healthcare or not, the reality is that there are new realities in the workplace in relation to COVID-19. There's changes in work. Most people or a lot of people are working from home. There's huge uncertainty. Um, uh, the furloughing, cutbacks, job losses. We look at Aer Lingus uh, just recently. Um, and again, we don't know the extent of this. So that creates a lot of uncertainty and anxiety for people. Um, also, uh, people are separated from their work environment. Uh, and we may not be able to draw perhaps on the support uh, of work colleagues in the way that we used to. Um, uh, so that may, means our supports might be a bit down. 
And then if you're the person who's grieving, if it's one of your colleagues, if it's one of your employees, if it's one of your staff who uh, is dealing with a COVID death, there are complications there as well. There's the social distancing. Um, at a funeral, that's limited. The gatherings are limited, although it's easing a bit. Um, you may be unable to be present when your loved one dies. We saw that that man uh, was able to be with his wife, um, but one of the other patients, uh, her sister, who herself was elderly, couldn't be there because uh, she herself was at risk. Um, you may be unable to attend or organize a funeral um, or may not have been able to do that. Um, and just a very simple one. And again, uh, uh, the male nurse highlighted it there, just the lack of access to physical social support, to be able to hug, to be able to kiss, and just not being able to do that, uh, that can add a huge amount to uh, the stress for employees. So what is the impact of COVID-19 on employees? Um, there are challenges. Um, grieving is difficult at the best of times. But with those added layers that we have now, uh, it can be even more challenging. Also, there, it's not just one loss, but there's a huge amount of losses that we're all coming to terms with. Um, you can see even here a picture of a bus and social distancing on a bus. And even using public transport for many people, that can be quite difficult at the moment. Also, in terms of uh, the types of losses and experiences that people are having, grief may be delayed. It may become hidden um, and it may become complicated in the sense that with uh, disasters or, or, or pandemics such as this or Ebola or SARS, we know that there can be an increase in the amount of complex grief or complicated grief. Um, but there are also positives. We've more awareness now and more support around death and grief. Uh, in the last three months, it's been brought right up uh, in front of us uh, in a way that it hasn't been before. And that gives us an opportunity to do grief differently in the workplace. Uh, and there are many places where uh, workplaces who handle grief very well, but there's also uh, maybe areas where we could uh, look at improving things or building on what we have. Um, the third thing in terms of positives is, I suppose, the learnings from lockdown. Um, this has given all of us an opportunity to reflect, reflect on what's important. Um, we've seen the tremendous outpouring of goodwill, of um, uh, thinking of others, which has made a huge difference uh, in uh, our lives and to the lives of people who are vulnerable and maybe at risk. Uh, Neighbours going the extra mile, reaching out. Uh, we think of on post and, and uh, local authorities and all the great work they have done. Um, so th there are positives there. There are things that we have surfaced and we've opened up. Uh, and, and these give us, I suppose, opportunities for um, shaping how we respond now. So that's the, grow, uh, the COVID context. What about the grieving process itself? What does that look like? Um, and again, I'm going to show a short animation now, um, which has, if you like, a bit of a whistle stop tour um, through grief. And again, this might be a point uh, just to have a, a bit of reflection. Look at the video, see what you think, see if there's anything surprising for you in what comes out in this video. And Amanda, again, if you could. Um, tee that one up. Listen, there's no right or wrong way to deal with the loss of a loved one. You can expect grieving to be rough and it's different for every single person. Another important thing, it's not just a matter of coping with loss, it's about coping with change. And that Wellcasters takes a lot of time. Today on Wellcast, we're dealing with a pretty difficult subject. How do you deal with the death of a loved one? How do you live your life in the face of a life-changing event? We don't have all the answers. And honestly, you're gonna have to work through your pain in your own way, at your own pace. But if you're looking for it, we do have some advice. First things first, you need to remember that grief is a process and not a task. 
you might have heard of a popular theory that breaks up bereavement into stages. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. While you might identify with some or all of these steps, you got to remember that grief is less like a staircase and more like a roller coaster. There are peaks and dips and they don't always happen in predictable ways. You might feel better for a while and then worse, and that's okay. It's natural to have an uneven journey with your grief. Don't be afraid of the pain. You shouldn't try to stuff your sorrow away into a place where you don't have to deal with it. It's just gonna stay there. In order for you to work through your grief, you're first gonna have to acknowledge that it exists. There are a lot of ways to do this. You might have to be alone for a bit. Maybe you need to write down your feelings in a journal or talk to someone. Do things that make you happy. When you're grieving, it's sometimes difficult to hold on to who you are. After all, so much of your energy is focused on the mourning of your loved one, which is fair, but it's easy to get sucked into a mind space where you can't even remember your former self. We want to tell you it's okay to take time to do the things that make you feel like yourself and give you joy. Recognize the relationship between the mind and the body. When you're experiencing grief, it's really easy to forget the things that you usually do as a matter of routine. Taking a shower, getting enough sleep, eating. Neglecting your physical health is only going to take a greater toll on your mental health, which is taking a pretty significant hit right now. So do yourself a favor and do us a favor and make an effort to take care of you. It's what your loved one would want. Reach out. Well, casters, if you take nothing else away from this episode, please remember this. You do not have to be alone in your grief. If your feelings are too overwhelming for you to sort out, that's okay. But go to someone else for help. It can be someone you know, a family member or a friend, or it can be a therapist or a professional who knows how to help people deal with this exact situation that you find yourself in right now. Just the act of talking out loud about your feelings can be incredibly cathartic. Finding someone who can help you sort them and work through them is even better. So I was just talking there about how we normally deal with grief at work. And this is from the Harvard Business Review. Um, and what it says is that um, workplace culture can sometimes be inhospitable to people suffering profound loss. Um, and in Bauer and Murray's 2018 study, participants described their expressions of grief as having to be restrained in the workplace. They reported that they felt that there was no space in the workplace deemed appropriate to release their grief, and that the bereaved employee was expected to show up and perform as if nothing had happened. I suppose what we're hoping um, now with the, the current COVID crisis that we might be able uh, to be a little bit different in situations and understand um, the importance for staff, for colleagues, for employees to be able to express their grief healthily in the workplace, not just at home, but in work as well. One way of looking at the grieving process is, as was in the, uh, the short animation, um, that idea of five stages. But what, what that video was saying is that, look, it's not like that. It tends to come and go. And this is another way of looking at how we grieve. And this can help you perhaps in your workplace with your colleagues in understanding how people grieve. Basically, what this tells us is that there are two types of coping that people do when they're grieving. And all of us are hardwired to do this type of coping. So normally we have within us the ability to cope with loss. And the two types of coping we do, the first one's called loss coping, and that's where we miss the person. Um, it's where we get what we call grief bursts. Uh, it's like you're, you're going along and something just hits you. It could be a smell, a song, something somebody says, and it's like you're right back in your grief. And that's what we call a grief burst. And of course, with a grief burst, one of the things that really helps is just allowing it, staying with it, 
And then what you find is the person will come out of it. But that's part of our loss coping, strong emotions, trying to understand, all to do with the loss. And the second type of coping that we do is what we call restoration coping. And this is where we try to deal with our life now as a result of what has happened, as a result of this loss. It means adjusting to a new reality. How many of us are doing that around COVID? It means, interestingly, at time, times, distraction from grief, grief understood only as loss coping. So what this means is um, we need at times to avoid the pain of our grief. Um, we can't be there all the time. We do need to go there sometimes, but not all the time. And adjusting to a new normal. Again, how often have we heard that in the last three months? What this dual process model tells us is that we have the ability to do these two types of coping. Everybody is hardwired to do that. And what we do is we go over and back between these two types of coping. So at the time of a loss, we might spend a lot of time um, on the loss coping, but even in the midst of uh, real difficulty and tragedy, we're able to get over and do a little bit of the restoration coping. Um, what we know is that we need to be able to do both. And we need to be able to do both in our workplaces. We need to be able to, yes, do the restoration, adjust to the new reality, um, deal with new things, adjust to a new normal, but most importantly, we also need to be able to do our loss coping. And a bit like what those two articles were saying, we need to have a workplace culture which allows the expression of grief and sees that as normal and healthy and not something to be avoided. Also, um, people grieve in different ways. And uh, any of you who are involved um, uh, in, in workplaces will know that people are very, very different. Um, and if I could just ask you a quick question, uh, you don't have to answer in the Q&A, but just for yourself, just think, do men and women grieve the same way? Um, just quick question on that. Do men and women grieve the same way? What do you think? Well, often we do think that men and women grieve differently not the same way. But another way of looking at this is the idea of styles of grieving. And what we know are, uh, uh, are two styles, if you like. One is what we call an intuitive style of grieving. And that's, if you like, people who feel their grief. These are people who have a need and desire to talk about and express their feelings openly. Here's the interesting thing. We also know of another style, which is what we call an instrumental style, is people who, if you like, do their grief, and they focus uh, coping with their grief through problem solving, responding through activity or work. The interesting thing is intuitive grieving is generally associated with uh, the female, and instrumental grieving is generally associated with the male. But it's a bit like a continuum. And the really interesting bit is you can have men who are intuitive grievers. That is their natural way of coping is a need and desire to talk about their feelings. And you can have women who are instrumental grievers, whose way of coping is not to seek out other support. So for yourself in your workplaces, um, think about your colleagues. Um, you know, there's different ways of coping. Not everybody is the same. Really good tip around this is ask your colleague, how do you cope normally with things? What would be helpful? Um, some people may not want to talk about the death. Other people may be just waiting for you to, um, to ask them. And what I would say is don't feel that you have to know all the answers or have everything ready, but just do take the risk to reach out to a colleague and just check with them. Um, how can I support you? What would be helpful? So we're going to have a, uh, an article uh, and just a, a brief run through an article. Uh, this is on how we can support grieving colleagues and uh, my, my colleague Orla is going to read this for you. And um, what I would like you to do, this is a second point, if you like, in the webinar, where again, I'm going to invite you uh, to think of questions. And what I'd like you to think about as Orla reads through this article is what stands out for you about workplace grief from Ariana's experience. And this is a woman called Ariana O'Dell whose brother died and it's her experience of workplace grief.
sorry, I was going to say I'll try not to read so fast, even though one part of my job is to keep an eye on time. So I'm conflicted. <laughs> so um, this is um, this is um, Ariana's story. Nick is in a coma is all I can remember my sister saying on the phone. A few hours later, I was on a panicked cross country red eyed flight home. I tried to calm my thoughts with an in-flight movie, which happened to be about a girl's brother who went into a coma and lived. Life is sadly not like the movies. There is no time after a loss that people will feel 100% ready to go back to work. But there is an irony there. The distraction can be very therapeutic. Sometimes when I'm on the subway, I'll remember the stark white hospital walls, or when I'm walking down the street, I'll have a flashback to my mother crying in the waiting room. And sometimes when I can't sleep, I'll remember touching my twin brother's hand for the last time. This past year has been a storm of emotions, often hidden behind my bedroom door or concealed by waterproof mascara. The week after my brother died, um, I did the only thing I knew how. I boarded a plane back to New York, showed up for work and tried to pretend that everything was normal. In school, I had learned how to solve complex math problems and how to write a cover letter, things that would help me advance my career. But when it came to grief, I found myself at a loss as to how to cope much less at work. I think the biggest challenge in our culture is our fear about losing our jobs if we're not on 24 seven, says Glenda Sullenterp, a St. Louis based counselor. Often that fear or some of it anyhow is self-imposed and simply learning to ask for support is one of the best yet most difficult ways of grappling with it. Here's how I've learned to do that so far, even though I'm still working at it every day. Have an honest conversation with your employer. Returning to work a week after my brother's passing was tough. Even though my employer told me to take as much time as I needed, I thought that if I could get back to work, it would distract me from the pain I was feeling. So my first day back, I plugged in my headphones and prayed no one would talk to me. Immediately, my manager asked if we could catch up. Walking to the conference room, I repeated to myself, don't cry, don't cry, not wanting to appear weak or incapable. How are you doing? He asked. My plan to suppress tears failed instantly. Unable to form a coherent sentence, I sat in front of him and sobbed. He asked empathetically, is there anything we can do? And he sent me home, something I knew I needed, but I was too proud to ask for. Simply knowing my boss cared about me made the transition back to work more manageable, and it created an atmosphere where I knew my feelings wouldn't be pushed aside. If you're working at a company that provides healthcare benefits, you likely have access to an employee assistance program. I was blindsided by grief after my father-in-law died, recalls freelance marketer Alison. I tried calling in sick. My boss knew what was going on, but she needed me to phone in for a meeting, which I was in no position to do. I just started crying. I hung up and I called my EAP. I was paired with a counsellor and that helped me to balance working and grieving. If you don't know what resources your employer may offer, your HR manager probably does. Or if you'd prefer to speak to your direct supervisor first, they can find out for you. The important thing is to just ask. I went to brunches, I dated, I went out on Friday nights with my friends and on the outside things were normal but on the inside, I was a mess. How does one go back to a normal routine when the most abnormal experience just occurred? Well, probably clumsily, 
said Gina Moffley, a private practice psychotherapist and clinical director of the Addiction Institute at New York's Mount Sinai Hospital. There is no time after a loss that people will feel 100% ready to go back to work. But there is an irony there. The very distraction may be therapeutic. Having structure can temporarily take you out of a sticky tar pit of grief and keep your mind working and occupied. Asking for mental health days or work from home opportunities can provide a safe environment while you ease back into your daily tasks. Coming back, I immediately tried to fall back into my fast paced life, pretending everything was more or less fine. I went to brunches and I dated, but on the inside I was a mess. I'm sorry, there's a repeat here. Um, you seem to be holding up well was something I heard countless times on my return. It was a well-intentioned comment, but many didn't know that my poker face was just a facade. Um, not only did I feel pain about my loss, I also felt guilty that I wasn't grieving in the right way. Um, the most helpful advice I received during my hardest months was a friend who told me that it's okay to grieve in the way that feels right. Whether it's a counsellor or a friend, um, advise people to talk openly about grief. Don't keep it inside. If you have to scream, scream. If you have to cry, cry. Um, I'm just going to skip down a little bit here. Grief takes time and we are often encouraged to take time to just feel, says Solentrop, the career counsellor. Grief will sneak up and grab you if you push it away. And usually at the most inopportune times, like when you're about to give that big presentation. It is okay to ask for help and it's okay to break down. The most important thing I've learned that while everyone deals with grief in different ways, it's okay to share what you've been going through with those around you, both in your personal and professional lives. It may even be essential to coping. How, what and when you share is up to you though. There is no single or correct way to do that. What's more, grief is not something you overcome. You just learn to live with it as best you can. But it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to break down. It's okay to be human. Grief is human. And you're a human first, a professional second. Thanks very much, Orla. And uh, I'm going to shorten my presentation. I'm just conscious of the time. So um, maybe uh, have, have a think about what was there in Ariana's article. Does anything strike you? And again, you can add that to the questions. Um, and I'm now going to hand you over to um, Linda, who's going to explain a little bit of what they have done in Technology University Dublin and how they have approached providing that kind of support in the workplace. Thank you, Linda. And while Amanda is getting on um, to putting up your slides, um, I'd just like to introduce Linda, um, who, as Brefney said, works at the Technological University Dublin. And I think they're very lucky to have her. She's um, the full responsibility for implementing the well-being and health promotion program across the university. And she has a, a passion for improving people's work lives um, and has taken on the incorporation of bereavement support and training within that. So thank you very much, Linda. Thanks so much for that, uh, Orla. And that's a lovely introduction there. Um, I'm conscious also of the time, so I'm going to fire ahead with my slides now. Um, and just to say thanks a million for asking me to participate today. I'm really delighted uh, to be doing that. So thanks for having me. Now, 
I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, so as Orla said, I'm Linda from the staff development team in TU Dublin. And just to give you a little bit of a background about TU Dublin, we are a brand new university. We used to be, so uh, Tala, Blanchardstown and ourselves DIT. So we amalgamated last year and we now have three and a half thousand staff members aged between 17 and 66 and we are over three locations and we have a really diverse range of staff. We actually have 65 nationalities. So, you know, a huge uh, varying staff group we have. So, um, as Orla said, I'm responsible along with my colleague in the staff development team for implementing the TU Dublin Wellbeing and Health Promotion Programme, which is a bit of a mouthful. And we are underpinned by the World Health Organization definition of health, which sounds amazing. It's a state of complete mental, physical and social well-being. And we focus on supporting and promoting health across the workplace lifespan. So from the minute that somebody comes in the door, um, through our induction to the minute they're leaving, you know, through either retirement or moving on somewhere else. We aim to support them um, as best we can throughout their, their workplace lifespan. And we seek to empower individuals to increase their own well-being, which is really something that's very important to us. It's not about us telling the staff member what's best for them. It's about um, giving skills and knowledge, support and policies to enable the workplace well-being um, for it to work for the actual individual. And we foster a, pos a positive work environment. So you can see here, it's staff development um, really runs the TU Dublin Wellbeing and Health Promotion Programme, but you can see there are many departments that contribute to promoting wellbeing in the university. And we adopt a comprehensive collaborative approach to wellbeing. So there's lots of different departments. Sports play a huge uh, part in that. Pastoral care, of course, health and safety. And in terms of uh, policies, then, of course, uh, human resources. So lots of different people and groups feeding into the overall well-being of the um, of the staff. So we together we provide a holistic and wide-ranging variety of initiatives to meet the needs of a diverse range of employees and we really do have a very diverse range. You know we have lots of academics obviously, researchers, admin and technical staff. So really important that we identify the different needs of each group and try to support those groups in, best, in the best way that we can. And we're extremely lucky, of course, we use a lot of our own in-house expertise and there's a wealth of expertise within the university. So really we are very, very lucky from that perspective. But we also use expert trainers and community providers to deliver our initiatives. And we focus on many different aspects of wellbeing. So this is just to give you an idea about how we promote our well-being. So we have a calendar of themes which we run at the beginning of every year and you can see there you know April we had parenting so we did a lot around trying to support staff who were attempting to parent and work at the same time from home. Um, in May we looked at career and positive workplace, we did lots around ergonomics and that kind of thing. Um, and June just gone, we focused on supporting um, working carers within the university. So lots of different things going on throughout the year. So why do we invest in workplace wellbeing and health promotion in TU Dublin? Uh, there are many, many benefits to, to, um, to bringing workplace wellbeing into your workplace. And you can see there, it makes perfect business sense to do so. There's a lot of research out there to say there are positive economic outcomes when organizations provide workplace wellbeing. And you can see there's some research that was done in 2011. They can yield a nine to one return on investment, which is incredible. Um, and that's through decreased absenteeism, 
reduced staff turnover, increased morale. So, you know, I mean, there's so many benefits to doing, uh, to bringing in these kind of initiatives into your organization. And you can see there, uh, there's also research to suggest that staff members perceive workplace wellbeing initiatives as a vital element in creating a successful organization where employees feel valued. And really that for us is the crux of everything that we're trying to do. You know, we just really want our staff to know that they are valued and that they are supported. So why did we decide to include grief and bereavement training as part of workplace wellbeing? It aligns with best practice in health promotion, focusing on spiritual health. Um, and it reflects the identified needs of staff, which is hugely important. Uh, you know, every year we send out a, a wellbeing survey and always consistently we have a lot of people come back to say, this is something that we need support around. And um, in our last wellbeing survey, 25% said it was the most important thing to focus on. So, I mean, that's a huge amount of people and we had a really robust response to the wellbeing survey. So that's an awful lot of people. Obviously, in response to COVID-19, this is what we're looking at at the moment. How can we support staff um, in the best possible way after, after what everybody has just gone through? You know, and obviously grief and bereavement is huge, along with the likes of mental health and supporting carers. Um, it fosters community engagement, which is a principle of health promotion, and it's a very uh, important part of it. But most importantly, for myself and for the organisation, what we're looking to do is to embed a sustainable culture of compassion, kindness and empathy at organisational level. And the realisation that at the end of the day, we are all individuals, we are all human, and we're all vulnerable. So how is it that we can create this kind of a culture in our organizations? So how can we achieve the same? By providing skills and knowledge necessary to support vulnerable groups, the training of managers, hugely important, and training around having those difficult conversations and actually asking somebody, how are you? I mean, that's hugely important and creating that kind of an open culture where people feel that they can be vulnerable in their place of work. Um, encouraging compassionate leadership and also training staff, of course, who have been bereaved themselves and what they can expect. Um, providing opportunity and policy to support staff. So as Brefney said, you know, around flexible hours um, if they're needed and even just down to providing a quiet area where somebody, if they are having, as, as Brefni said, one of those grief bursts, but there's somewhere you can say, would you like to go off to this area? And they can just feel those feelings and that's okay. Even though they're in the work environment, um, you're giving them that opportunity to work through um, those emotions. Um, bereavement policy as well, that's something that we are looking into and that came as a result of having uh, Brefni in to do the training with us uh, last year. Um, providing ongoing support through an EAP and I realise an awful lot of people feel that an EAP is not something that they can provide in their organisation but really if that's the case it's more about knowing where the resources are knowing where the information is that you can say, okay, we can't provide this, but we can provide um, assistance in terms of pointing people in the right direction and letting them know where they can get that help. And I know the hospice uh, provides fantastic resources. So that's something that's really important as well. And just then at fostering and encouraging individual acts of compassion and kindness, which can spread organization wide. And that's down to all of us to change the way we react to people. Um, and that realization that if somebody is reacting in a way that's totally, you know, you feel is a bit, I don't know, uh, aggressive, that they may actually be in a lot of pain. So just trying to adopt that feeling of compassion for the person and that kind of a ripple effect, you know, 
that can be seen then throughout the organization. Um, and then recent research recognizes compassion to be an essential aspect of a productive work environment, showing supporting compassion to colleagues is, a vi is vital to sustained job satisfaction and work related motivation. So this is an example of the advertisement that we sent out to all our staff back in May um, before we had Brefney in to give his talk. And we had fantastic engagement around this. Um, you know, an awful lot of people, even those that couldn't attend on the day, were coming to us or emailing us and say, look, we're so happy to see that um, this is being you know, that, that there's support out there for staff who are grieving or bereaved. So even the people that didn't get the benefit of the training session, they were still, they felt valued for having uh, been given the opportunity to attend. So this is just an idea of some of the feedback and I have to say it's probably some of the best feedback that we've received. We send an evaluation out after every initiative um, and you can see there, we asked participants, what would you do differently following the session? Um, and people said, be prepared to support colleagues in a compassionate way, be mindful of others, not only in work, but those I meet in life, be more aware and understanding. And I love this one. This is really a, an important one is, I have a staff member who's on leave following a loss. I will now consider more carefully how to support them on the return so it meets their needs. And that's, you know, really, really important piece of this puzzle. Um, the overall experience of participants, it was extremely helpful, comforting and informative. The sense of not being alone. Um, I'd love to see more like this. And this one, it was an excellent course, an invaluable opportunity to take time out and talk about something that affects us all. I cannot emphasize enough how useful and grateful I am that I got the opportunity to attend a session like this. So, I mean, really in terms of feedback and evaluation, it, it doesn't get much better than that. So um, I would say to you, having had the experience of having the hospice in and giving this training, it's really a win-win situation for everybody. Um, and I would highly recommend um, having this on your well-being agenda. Thank you so much, Linda. That that's really um, rounded things off. Moving from a sort of a principles into action, um, and 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 lovely to hear. Thank you for that. And I have some questions specifically for you um, that we might pick up offline around the surveys you use and so on. Um, and we have questions for, for both Brefni and Linda, and we'll go through a couple of them now um, and mm -hmm. acknowledge that some of them will get picked up in the resources. And, and I think this one is really important in every day and also post COVID. It's from somebody who they were redeployed into a new work situation. Um, so they're asking, um, as, as someone redeployed with new work colleagues, new management, um, and suffering a bereavement, um, that it's sort of a place where you might struggle. Um, so what should be done in that case? How would you help a person who is bereaved in a new job? I think it would be very important, first of all, when somebody is redeployed, um, that uh, the person who is their uh, manager or supervisor would would know about uh, um, what what's going on, and that the person may have to who's bereaved may have to take uh, that step themselves and say, "Look, this is what's going on." Um, people may not know there's been an awful lot of change. Also, where possible, uh, for the supervisors point of view or manager's point of view to find out uh, how the person is particularly what might be going on and, and just even in terms of of engaging with the person in a welcome chat and just see how they are and is there anything major that anything that we would need to know that might be helpful uh, without prying too much but I, I think it's something it, it's a very difficult situation and um, what Ariana was saying in her article was look what I learned was I need to reach out as well uh, and, and sometimes we may have a fear of reaching out that we mightn't be met with 
compassionate or it might be seen in some other way, I think we have to take that risk. And what I, I hope we'd be encouraging today is that um, managers, supervisors or people who, are, who do have new staff coming in would be open to the fact that an awful lot has gone on in COVID um, and to be open and maybe take the initiative as well with people without prying. But I think sometimes we have to take a bit of a risk. Um, if we get it wrong, somebody can always say to us, well, I don't want to talk about that or there's nothing going on. But if we, if we ask the question, at least we give the person the opportunity to answer. If we don't ask the question, then the person doesn't get a chance to say anything. Linda, I don't mm. know, is there anything you want to add with that? Yeah, I mean, that's a really, really tough situation. You know, you kind of depend on your colleagues who know your history and know what you're going through. So it is a really, really tough one. I suppose um, what I always say is it, it takes a lot of bravery to show vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the more of us that do it, the easier it gets because we change the culture. So it's taking that first step and saying, look, this has happened to me and having that you know whatever short conversation with a, a new manager just to keep them let them know um what what's gone on um you know i i think that would be for me anyway that would be the first step okay good thank you both um and then there were, there were a theme of questions around you know how best to show empathy and to develop an approach for that and you know maybe do's and don'ts um around a grief and grieving but I'm going to ask you it specifically around the case of when people are still working remotely and um, how, how do you support a, a grieving um, employee? Yeah that, that's um, that's challenging um, I, I suppose that the hospice principles and the, the care and inform series that we have would be like reaching out uh, and, and taking the initiative to reach out we have to reach out in different ways now we're not meeting people uh, face to face in the same building so uh, it might be um, texting it might be calling the person emailing them just saying look I'm thinking of you how are you doing and um, that's if it's a, a find the colleague and I, I know somebody is bereaved and just keeping in touch with them that way um, also the bit a bit like what we've been saying in the last question is a bit again can I show my vulnerability and, and let people know um, I know with the, the the work that we did with Technology University Dublin, um, you could see where, where people were linked in who hadn't actually been together in the same building for a couple of months. And just the value of being able to hear others who, who also were, were experiencing. It might be about creating some of those spaces, if, if you're coming at it from the organisational point of view, where we can do that. That might be kind of team meetings or, or whatever, and, and proactively doing that so that we can link in with people and people may then choose or not to uh, say about what's going on for them. Again, Linda, right. I'm not sure, is there anything you might, might add on that? Um, just, I suppose, what's key is really the training of managers around this. Um, and that's something that we're looking at at the moment. And I know I mentioned that whole idea of having those difficult conversations with staff whether it be around mental health or bereavement or that kind of thing. So um, I think it's key that organisations step up and have that kind of training in place for, for managers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. And, and to anticipate that this is a normal part of, of yeah. working life. Yeah. Listen, thank you both, um, because I'm conscious we've just hit two o'clock um, and I know Brefney is just going to do a finish off of the session. Mm -hmm. um, thank you to everybody who participated and sorry that we didn't get to all the questions, but I do believe that the resources will, um, will answer some of them for you um, and thank you for 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 being here thank you linda Great. and on to you briefly lovely and again thanks uh, orla for um uh for emceeing this and just to say thank you again to everybody who has taken part um and maybe just as a way of closing the session uh we we've covered quite a bit in, in probably quite emotive topics Maybe just as a way for yourself to ground yourself as you leave this, um, I'm going to ask you to use the Q&A function again. And maybe if you could just think for a moment in silence, is there a word which describes how you are now as we come to the end of this webinar? So is there a word which describes how you are now as we come to the end of this webinar? And I'd invite you to pop that word into the Q&A uh, function, just as a way, a symbolic way of closing the session. Um, the other thing that I would say for anybody who's experienced bereavement, um, whether it's uh, somebody in your family or your close circle, or if it's you yourself, 
Um, just to be aware that talking about this stuff like we've been doing today, and it's very important, but it can also stir memories in you and stir um, pain and hurt in you. And just to be very kind to yourself and to be very gentle with yourself, particularly after this webinar, and maybe do something to look after yourself um, after the webinar. It might be a cup of tea, a little walk or whatever, just to look after yourself and acknowledge um, if, if that is the case, uh, that this may have stirred up some things for you. So I would invite you to, to uh, pop your word in. It can just be a word or a phrase, whatever it's like. And again, the idea is just really, I suppose, as a way of closing. And could I, on behalf of the Irish Hospice Foundation, um, say a big thank you to all of my colleagues, huge team involved here, both the bereavement team and the communications team and all the staff in the Irish Hospice Foundation. I hope you found this webinar helpful. We will be following up with a resource pack to all our participants, and we will uh, attempt to provide resources for the questions we have haven't answered. Thank you very much.